it's just that our fitness goals were broadly different. I mean, at least mine, you know, because like, I'd say your fitness goal was, you know, you like wanted to be a faster bike rider and, you know, lose a little weight and whatever else. My fitness goal as, you know, as a, as a recent divorcee is I want to look good naked. <laughs> so like, that did really, I mean... Welcome back to the Cycling Tips Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fretz. I'm Neil Rogers. I'm James Wong. And I'm Abby Mickey. Who are you over in the corner? Oh, hi. I'm Jonathan Vodders. I didn't know if I was supposed Special to Special guest. <laughs> Special guest Jonathan Vodders. We're going to be chatting with him in a little bit. Before we get into the meat of today's episode, I must tell you, this week's episode is brought to you by Reynolds Cycling, the carbon wheel experts. Reynolds is committed to engineering the highest quality carbon bicycle wheels that inspire, excite, and improve the cycling experience. Using innovative technology, relentless testing, and quality manufacturing, we know that every Reynolds rider will experience the difference. And their aluminum wrap is really good over the top of pumpkin pies. (laughs) (laughs) Head on over to ReynoldsCycling.com to get the year's best pricing during their annual cyber sale Save 20 to 35% site-wide with new carbon wheel sets starting at $845 and Reynolds Wrap starting at $399. Sale ends December 9th. Thanks to Reynolds for sponsoring today's episode. Thanks, Reynolds. Today's episode, we're going to be chatting about a whole bunch of stuff. We've obviously got Jonathan Vodders here with us. We'll be talking about the throwdown, the imminent throwdown between you two over here. Uh, We're going to be talking about Egan Bernal and his decision to ride the Giro Tour double. Sophie DeVoist and her alleged decision to take doping products. Then maybe a snack break. But let's get into it. Neil, you're going to lead the way on, on segment number one with JV to your right here. What are we talking about? Well, before we get into Mr. Vodders here, just a couple quick news items. And JV, obviously, we'd love to have you chime in. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear actually what you think about Egan Bernal's um, answer to a question uh, the other day. He was being interviewed by a Spanish newspaper, AS. Uh, he was being awarded the AS America del Deporte Award. Um, and he more or less said, I'd like to ride the Giro. I mean, this is the Tour de France champion, on, as we've discussed, on the squad with now four Grand Tour champions. And you know, I'm always impressed with Bernal, how, uh, how philosophical he is and how mature he is for his age. He's just 22. And he said, uh, the thing I'd like to do is ride the Giro and then the Tour. I'm very excited about the chance of riding the Giro. It's a beautiful race. I've lived in Italy. But this is the part that really caught my attention. He said, I think it can be looked at in two ways. The first is that I'm young. And how many more tours will I win? Or the way I see it, I'm 22 years old. I've already won a tour. I've already done what I wanted to do. I was the first Colombian to do it. And I feel that I'm good at doing what I do. Obviously, I'll try to win another tour, also a Giro, also a Vuelta. But whatever happens, I've already won the tour. And no one can take that away from me. It's not that I'm relaxing. But I think I've already done something very good. And so I shouldn't feel any pressure. And so with that, sounds as though he will go to the Giro as the team's leader and go to the tour as maybe a bit of a wild card. Is this a way for the team to kind of open up the possibility of him not being the leader at the Tour de France? I think so. JV? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty tough. I don't think they have anyone else that can win the Tour de France, so it depends what the commercial pressures are then. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Big statement. So, I mean, the, the, Garrett Thomas no won it the year before and Chris Froome won it the year before that. Yeah, I mean, I, I just don't think Froome will quite be back to full strength uh, by the summer. And Garant, um, there's one time trial, and it's uphill. I mean, I just I don't see the tour. Like, if you look how Garant has won his tours, it's always, I mean, obviously, super strong time trials, but also, like, the tour he won. Sorry, one tour, not tours. Um, you know, the, the foundation for that was on the cobblestone stage. Um, and an early flat stage where he basically made the splits, you know, through the crashes and crosswinds and whatnot, and other contenders didn't. That was the foundation for his tour win. Hands up. He did win consecutive mountaintop finishes at that tour. True. You know, in a, in a scenario where everyone was sort of watching for him, and again, I just, I don't see Garrett capable of winning a second Tour de France. Um, mm-hmm. that's, I, I think that, you know, he's going to be 34 years old. Um, we're in a Tour de France that 
realistically has one, maybe two crosswind stages, has about 10 flat time trial kilometers in the whole thing, and they're at the very end. Um, it's, it's not to take anything away from Garrett. I just, I don't think that it's that I, I just don't think he can win that tour. I don't think Froome can win it. So like Bernal has to be their option to win the tour. So if Bernal is going to focus on the Giro, then, but listen, I mean, Ineos is a, it's more of a extremely wealthy individual than it is a commercial sponsor. So in a way, perhaps they don't care in a way that Sky did. Like Sky would have said, no, you know, that you have to win the Tour de France. Like that's giving us the bulk of everything that we've built this entire sponsorship mm-hmm. around. Whereas in Aos, you know, Jim Ratcliffe may say, hey, you know, like this is this is kind of my money. So let's let's mix it up a little bit. Hmm. Uh, right or wrong, I sort of view this a bit as a um, deference from Bernal to Froome as well. Sort of like, hey, I'm not going to get in your way of your last, really realistically his last chance at winning a fifth tour. Um, you know, sort of like I will go to the Giro and if I'm better than you at the tour, I'm better than you at the tour, but I'm just sort of carving a path for Froome. And sort of like, I'm not going to be the reason you don't get to go for that fifth tour win. Yes or no? Sure. I mean, that could be a possibility. Um, I mean, why not? Like that's, you know, that would be obviously very kind of him, but I think having a little bit, not much, but a tiny bit of sort of insider insight into that, you know, Bernal just really wants to win the Giro. Like he, Hmm. He his personal like his heart is more into winning the Giro this coming year than it is the Tour de France. Yeah, he raced for an Italian team for two years before joining Team Sky. Speaks Italian. He yeah. wanted to win the Giro this year before he broke his collarbone. So yeah. uh, no mystery there. That's a really it, good point. It is. A, it's a tight gap between the Giro and the Tour this year. So am I, am I correct? The, the double is going to be particularly difficult because of the Olympics. The Tour de France starts at the end of June. It starts a full two weeks before it did last year. Uh, or a week and a half or so before it did last year, uh, which obviously compresses that that timing and making it even more difficult to to potentially do the double. Which, I mean, it, you're you're sitting here with as a competitor to this team that has been dominant for so long. Does this, I mean, does this bring you some joy <laughs> to, to hear this? Well, thing? I mean, we have to worry about our own game. You know, like who who do we have that that can win the tour? Let's take. Renal and Froome and Garen Thomas out of the equation, but there's still quite a few, you know, really great riders out there. I mean, I'd imagine like Roglic is going to take a shot at the tour. I don't know that as a fact, but I would, wouldn't be surprised if he was going to take a shot at the tour. Um, Dumoulin, you know, Dumoulin, of course. Uh, I mean, there's a, but there's a whole host of guys, right? Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I'm more concerned about raising our own game than I am as to whatever Ineos is doing. It would be remarkable if Ineos which has on its roster the last three winners of the tour didn't win the tour this year. I think it would be seen as something of a tactical blunder, particularly if they sent Bernal to the Giro and he ends up not winning the Tour de France and they don't end up winning the Tour de France. Uh, you know, as you say, maybe maybe because it's all Ratcliffe's money and, and they don't have these commercial pressures and they don't have a sponsor breathing down their neck saying, if you don't win the Tour de France, you know, you're in big trouble. Maybe it doesn't matter, but... Saying, it still, I think, will be viewed as an error if they manage to not win the Tour de France as a result of sending Bernal to the Giro. You know, Jonathan, view it that way anyway. I don't disagree with anything you said, although, and this is purely speculative, I suspect that Chris Room will be at 100% for the Tour de France next year. I think he will be as good as ever. He's really out there do. like water skiing and stuff. So is he really? There was a photo of him wakeboarding or something in Miami with uh, George Hincapie this week. Really? Yeah. I missed that. <laughs> yeah, it's not to say that I'm not saying Chris Froome can't ever be back to a very very high level of competition. I just think July is a short time horizon for that to happen. You know, e- even if even if biomechanically, muscularly, whatnot, he can get all the way back. Um, you know, he's <laughs> he's missing. <laughs> Months and months and months and months of foundation. I mean, one of the reasons that, you know, World Tour riders are so good is that, is that they don't have dogs. <laughs> um, one of the reasons is that you're always sort of building off the last year, you know, as to say, like, I've found that with a lot of times with classics riders, they'll have a great classic season when they do the Vuelta the year before, as in like the Vuelta is the foundation for Flanders the next year, which I know that's a little bit, most people think of training in, in more the medium term, 
you know, as opposed to the long term, like short term, okay, you're just resting and you're trying to peak for an event. And then medium term, you're training really like the six months before you're training really hard. And, but there's a big snowball effect with these guys. And like his snowball basically stopped. And he said zero grand tour, zero, you know, it, it, it takes a little while to get that snowball going again. Um, so that's the, you know, he, he's just, to me, no matter what he can come back to training wise and whatnot, it, he's missing 2019 as a foundation. Yeah. When Chris Froome shows up to the start line of the 2020 Tour de France, the last grand tour that he will have finished will have been the 2018 Tour de France, correct? So essentially 23 months right. out of Grand Tour riding. Right. That's right. When, when JV <laughs> was talking about uh, training in the short term and the long term, I thought that could have been a good segue to our Flagstaff throwdown. Mm. But uh, we've got a couple other little news items Let's to get discuss through. first. You even said snowball, which I thought was also <laughs> relevant. Um, Sophie DeVoist. Belgian rider for Park Hotel Valkenburg. This news came out about a week ago, but we have not recorded a podcast since it came out. Uh, tested positive for steroids during an out-of-competition test on September 18th. Uh, she did, a, I think, a Facebook post, uh, acknowledged the positive for exogenous steroids, which means external, right, synthetic, outside of the body, um, but denied any wrongdoing, said, I'm screaming my innocence, I realize a lot of people won't believe me. I'll do everything in my power to prove my innocence and to clear my name. She had been awarded Flandrian of the Year, having won Brabantse Peel, and she was set to transfer to Mitchelton Scott for 2020. <laughs> the dogs are growling at each other. <laughs> no, it's just it's just as happy. What's up? As he dog? just as he growling at. Yep. Okay. From like eight inches away. Yeah. Too. They're just <laughs> facing each other. It's like a. So before we were recording, uh, Abby, you were asking Jonathan, uh, you know, Sophie DeVoyce is saying, uh, I'm going to try to prove my innocence. And yeah, you were she, asking. She did kind of the exact thing that every single person that tests positive for anything does, which says, I'm innocent. We're testing my B sample. Right. And so you were asking Jonathan, how often has a rider who's tested positive been able to prove their innocence specifically for steroids? So I was talking specifically about um, androgenic steroids. Um, or androgens. Um, so, you know, what she's claiming is, is supplement contamination. And to be really clear, supplement contamination, as much as it just sounds like an excuse, whatever else, it is a very real, real problem. Like, a, you know, if you just took a cross section of the, of sort of the healthy population, people that are going and buying vitamins at GNC or whatever else, um, you'd have a huge number, a hugely high percentage of people that would, that would test uh, positive under the scrutiny that these athletes are put under. So that's not to say that her excuse isn't bullshit, but it's to say that like sometimes they're telling a true story. That being said, Underwater regulations, we have what's known as strict liability, which means it doesn't actually matter how it got into your system. Um, it, you know, aliens could have put it there. It could have been stuffed down your throat by a bitter ex-husband or wife or whatever. Um, it could have been supplement contamination. You could have intentionally, like, there's a, it doesn't, they do not care how it got there. The fact is, if it was there, then you know, you have committed a doping offense. So like testing the B sample is a little bit like maybe, sh you know, she gets lucky and it doesn't show up in the B sample and, and you know, and off she goes. But, y y you know, the, the once you've got a positive A and B sample with an exogenous androgenic element or an exogenous anabolic steroid, um, that's a positive test. Now, what's going to happen is... The, the the arbitration board that takes on this case, if she decides to, to pursue it um, and she doesn't just settle, um, they will look very hard as to the likelihood that it was a supplement contamination versus intentional use of, of, of an exogenous steroid. Um, and you'll be able to tell what their determination is on that based basically on how long the sentence is. Um, a good example of that um, is uh, Tom Danielson, who obviously admitted to doping while he was on our team, then tested positive again. Um, in theory, under the rules, had the arbitration committee or the USADA determined that it was intentional doping, um, he should have been given a lifetime ban. 
So most likely in the tests. Instead of the four-year yeah, suspension. Yeah, exactly. Instead of the four-year suspension he got. So the four-year suspension, instead of getting lifetime, he got four years, meaning that something in the testing results indicated to them that it was um, supplement contamination versus uh, intentional doping. And how you determine that, you can't exactly. What the carbon isotope ratio test, and I'm sorry I'm getting into like a little bit of a scientific rabbit hole here, but the carbon isotope ratio test, which is what is used to determine whether an androgen is present or not, is basically looking at the carbon isotope ratio, just like almost like carbon dating of like really old bones and stuff, as to whether that ratio bends toward... Um, a hormone that would have been synthesized using Mexican yams. I'm not kidding here. When, when synthetic testosterone is, is, starts out as a Mexican yam, um, whereas natural testosterone starts out either in your testicles or other fun little body parts. Um, so Synthetic EPO comes from Chinese hamster ovaries. Correct. That is right. Yes, that is correct. It does. Yes, it comes from, yep, that's right. Really? Yeah, truly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely right. Yeah. Fun facts I never not wanted to <laughs> yeah. know. That is absolutely right. Um, so they look at this ratio, and in basically if it's off um, to a certain degree, then they'll – you know, they'll call you positive. Now, if you can imagine like a, almost like a dial on a stereo, there's sort of like a one to a 10 on this. Like if it's a 10, it means, you know, there was clearly a ton of this stuff in the system. It was clearly a lot of Mexican yam synthesized androgens in there. If it's a one, it means they're getting a little bit of sort of almost like background radiation, like a little like, oh, you know, okay, what is this? Now that can be due to two things. That could be because the anabolic you took was from a long time ago, or it can be that it was in such a tiny quantity that it was probably due to a supplement being contaminated. How do you determine which is which? I don't have the answer to that, and I, I don't actually think that a lot of scientists do either. It's, it's, this is really, really tricky stuff in, it, in, in the ultimate judgment, in the scenario that it's sort of like a one or two volume on the dial. Ultimately, it comes down to the subjective opinion of, of the scientists that are, that are advising the people on the arbitration panel. Certainly, if an athlete could produce the supplement and say, this says it's safe, and if you test it in a lab and it shows that it's contaminated and this is what I was taking, that would help. But argument. even then, they can't prove that that was a supplement no. that they took. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, like, basically, at the end of the day, she's going to get a suspension no matter what. It just is a matter of how much it'll be. And I wonder what that means because she's going from... Um, Valkenberg. Yeah, Park Hotel to uh, Mitchelton Scott next year. So I wonder what that will mean for her team switch. Well, and the thing is, like... Yeah, it, it's also a matter of perception, right? Let, let, like, let's say you give her the benefit of the doubt and she really did have an issue with a tainted supplement. At this point, the problem from her perspective is that no one's going to believe her. It doesn't matter. Um, and then I guess, you know, continuing on with that, like if, if you know, Jonathan, you were saying that the, the, the issue of tainted supplements is a very real problem. Um, if it is such a real and known problem, if you are a professional athlete, why would you even take that risk? Well, you know. I mean, some here's do. the thing is, is that some do. that's tricky. Um, you know, supplement, uh, the contaminated supplement could mean contaminated energy bar. You know, um, it could mean that you stop at a 7-Eleven and you're bonked out of your mind on a long ride and you're just like, oh, the, I don't know. Yeah, this protein bar, not protein bar, whatever, this energy bar looks pretty good. I'll, you know. I mean, it's not um, – the contamination sometimes can come from very unusual places. It's not that you're, you know, using sort of, I don't know, some sort of like real borderline – I mean, you know, vitamin C. Like, I think probably everyone here has taken a vitamin C supplement at some point in time. Unfortunately, like, if that vitamin C was produced in a factory that had DHEA being produced right next to it, which is totally plausible – like could be just a little bit of DHEA dust blows over into the vitamin C. Now, that doesn't happen as much as it did 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So like the supplement contamination, it's getting less and less and less and more highly regulated by the FDA, especially in the United States and, and actually abroad. It's been more highly regulated for a while. But that risk is – it's still there. I mean it's just like people have a peanut allergy, right? You know, like there's just, even like this little trace amount of peanuts can totally set off their allergy, and it's in a product like peanuts isn't even listed on the label. 
We've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars over the years uh, batch testing supplements to make sure that you know they're they're clean. Um, and you know we have a, we have um, you know we've had a lot of people help us with this, right? And it's you know batch testing. You have to understand the limitations. Is you're taking one bottle of vitamin C, vitamin B, or whatever it is, like some amino acid, and you're giving it to the people who are testing it. Inform Sport. That's who our sort of sponsor partner is right now. Um, and they're taking, you know, five pills from that bottle and then doing an analysis on that. Mm. And so then what about the other hundred pills? And what about the bottle that was sitting right next to it? And what about the case that's out on the truck? And so it's you're, you're batch testing it. Like, well, it was, it was produced in this batch. So batch 127, lot 523 or whatever. But just because those five pills didn't have the little bit of powder doesn't necessarily. So even testing for supplement contamination is... Very limited. It's, yeah, it's not like the contaminants are evenly distributed among Correct. everything. So exactly. Hmm. Well, interesting. And I mean, then it could be a steak that you ate in Mexico. <laughs> well, I was, uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, like when I was over in in uh, Taiwan, uh, I remember Nathan Haas would just not eat anything. He no, you you basically turn into a vegetarian. While yeah, he was and there. that's in yeah. in in China that there is no restriction in the use of clenbuterol in in raising beef um, or pork, and so they do. And so there's definitely clenbuterol in a lot of the beef and the pork that you would eat in China or Taiwan. It's not necessarily seen as a bad thing there. Um, Michael Rogers tested positive. Yeah. And so after it just, you know, yeah, we, when we're in China, uh, when we do, even though we're, you know, in, in the tour of Guangxi, they put us up in the nicest hotels and it's the best food source you could possibly get. We advise the riders to just not eat any meat for a week. Um, he brought a pile of beef jerky from home. Yeah. That, yeah. yeah. Which I'm not actually sure you're allowed to travel with that, but... Yeah, you can because it's cured, so yeah. you can travel with it. Okay. Like, the same as you could travel with hard cheeses. Neil would know. Neil's uh, under examination for a number of fruit crimes. Fruit crimes, yeah. <laughs> That's a story for another time. But yeah, my uh, application for global entry with customs got a little spicy <laughs> because of an apple that I left in my backpack about eight or nine years earlier, which I didn't realize they had made a record of. Fruit crimes. <laughs> Well, you know what? I, my takeaway from this is that it's there's a lot of gray area. I mean, Sophie DeVoist is saying, I will try to prove my innocence, but really, she cannot prove her innocence, whereas the arbitration panel may actually believe her story, and yet she won't be, quote-unquote, acquitted. She will still be sanctioned. So, That's absolutely you know, right. That's there is no, there will be no black and white. And six months, from, even if she gets the minimum, which is whatever, six months, I don't know what the minimum is, but even if she she's only suspended for six months, it's still into 2020 when her contract with Mitchelton Scott starts. And so that kind of, I mean, they... I'm sure that contract has been would up, not, right? Yeah. yeah there's, there's no I don't way. know if there's been any news so far from Mitchelton Scott, but she's suspended from, from Park Hotel. So, um... Which, you know, brings me back to a little bit of Jeffersonian philosophy that my dad always ground into my head as an attorney. My, my dad always said, you know, Jeffersonian judicial philosophy was, you know, that I would rather see um, 10 guilty men go free than have one innocent man put in jail. And it, the legal system should always be set up that it's, you know, favoring. And generally speaking, testing is set up to give some margin of error. Um, but... You know, in this case, um, you know, what if she's innocent? Or even more complicated than that, what if she was taking X supplement, eating X bar, and it did have an anabolic androgenic agent, and it was actually helping her? So it was totally unintentional, but yet her performance was increased by this unintentional action. What do you do there? <laughs> um, it's, so your point, Neil, that Dogs there is a lot of gray area. I mean, across the board, there is a lot of gray area. Um, and to me, you know, it, it, it's there have certainly. I mean, I I firmly believe like Tom Zerbel, who his test is the same same story as this right here. I firmly believe that Tom Zerbel was a case of supplement contamination, a hundred percent. And yet he served a two-year suspension, and so you feel. As, and sometimes the suspension isn't the last of it, right? I mean, this 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 can very well end a career. At the very well, least, it's, Tom had a contract with us for the next year. Yeah, when yeah exactly. Positive. It, it, you know, at the very least, it's gonna it's gonna, you know, dramatically uh, downgrade you in the court of public opinion. So, yeah. uh, it would take quite a lot for you to fully come back from that. It, it would almost take you sort of already being a superstar. I mean, if you think about the guys that were sort of able to come back from these sort of things and still be successful, it's because they were hyper. -successful. 
successful beforehand. Anybody on that edge there is is really you know with really Tom, in trouble. I mean, with Tom, like I hundred percent believed him at the time that it happened. Um, I never questioned for a second that that you know Tom's herbal was taking steroids. Same, I, never for a second. Never for a second. And so a you know, but my subjective opinion was not allowed to come into play regards to our sponsorship contracts. And so he, he wasn't on our team yet, but it was basically like, okay, we, we cannot take you onto our team as a result of this, of a result of this. And therefore, you know, it was just, it was like, it was process. There was, there wasn't a, a degree of humanistic subjectivity sort of allowed into that. And therefore he lost his opportunity to race at the highest level for the rest of his life. I mean, certainly he got to race, you know, with rally and did a great job and won a bunch of national championships or whatever, but he never got a chance to do the highest, highest level races in the world as a result of what was most likely a supplement contamination to which to this day, he does not know what it was. Like he just, he's got some ideas, but has really no idea. Or Let's down. talk about the Flagstaff Flowdown. We can keep this one brief because this is obviously going to be on YouTube at some point as well. It's going to be this whole story is going to be told in video form. Yes, but we do want to. We want to set the scene here. What's going on tomorrow? <sighs> I want to mention JV. You're looking pretty fit right now. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> so I would just like to preface this by saying the original idea, more than anything else, about me trying to beat Jonathan Vodders up Flagstaff or him trying to beat me is two 46 year old dudes. Trying to get back into a, something that resembles fitness. I mean, I think that was really the idea. It was like, let's. We hit, we, I mean, we've been talking about it for a year now, right? Yeah, I mean, it's just that our fitness goals were broadly different. I mean, <laughs> at least mine, you know, because like. I'd say your fitness goal was, you know, you like wanted to be a faster bike rider and, you know, lose a little weight and whatever else. My fitness goal, as, you know, as a. As a recent divorcee, is I want to look good naked. <laughs> so, like, they're just really, I mean, it's not, I just. I, so, this Flagstaff challenge is really a shifted, I think. I uh, mean, it's like Neil would, so Neil, would, Neil would send me a text of like, hey, you know, my, uh, my, um, you know, my my threshold is up to you know four point two watts per kilo, and I would send him something back saying, "Yeah, I can bench one sixty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So fair. if you race up and then down, <laughs> the results might be different. Yeah, I mean, if we could like if we could throw in some like some clap push ups, sort of like about halfway up, <laughs> you're dead, man. <laughs> and, and I guess that means we're not going to need those fancy champion system custom kits that we that we got, right? <laughs> Because apparently you're not going to be wearing one. <laughs> we could do a flex contest at the top. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you and I went and rode Flagstaff, just the two of us, a few weeks ago, two, three weeks ago now, um, before all this snow, and kind of kept it conversational till the hard part at the top. And I would say the result that day, I was feeling pretty good about my chances. Mm. Since then, I've had a lung infection that's lasted three weeks. Um, it's snowed several times, including 22 inches a week ago. Uh, I actually just went and did a recon uh, up Flagstaff just before we started recording to make sure it was even be rideable. Uh, tell me a little bit about, because you had actually said, I need a few more weeks. I need to get different gears on the bike. I need a little more preparation. Tell me about how you're feeling between the last time we rode. And today, Kaylee, Kaylee, do we still have what? What do we call it? The Excusatron. The Excusatron Four Thousand. We got up. we got some solid ones from both of them. We've got wants to look good naked over here, and we've got lung infection on this side. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna have to pull that back out again. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I've. Uh, I mean, when we did that ride, I was just back from being in Japan and like a three week road trip um, where I rode exactly zero. Um, <laughs> And my hardest form of exercise was, yeah, whatever. Like, I was in the hotel gym here and there. and um, You said you got a trainer. But, yeah, since then, this is almost a month ago, I guess, right? Like, I, I, uh, I borrowed a trainer from, from, our, from our warehouse here in Boulder and uh, indoor trainer. Yep. First time I've ridden an indoor trainer since 2002. <laughs> um, in, tax indoor trainer. <laughs> This segment brought to you by tax. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not at all. Um, and um, so, and I, you know, I did a couple workouts here and there. I think I've ridden the trainer like 
three times. And, you know, I, I don't have a heart rate monitor or a power monitor or anything else. So I came up with this workout that I'm pretty proud of um, where I put it on um, Spotify pop workout. And uh, so we do a three song warm up, just trying to kind of keep it light and loose. And then I do one song like flat out and then one song easy and then one song flat out and one song easy, one song flat out. Which I do it four times. And, um, and it, like, gen- like this, you know, songs gotten a lot shorter. I was thinking these are going to be five minute intervals, but like, they're more like three minute intervals. Um, so like the whole workout lasts around 35 minutes. Pretty, pretty proud about that. Which is exactly how long flex sets yeah. going to take you guys. That's so. exactly. Yeah. The con- <laughs> road conditions are not optimal. It's going to be wet. There's going to be a lot of sand and melt, snow melt, uh, and some in the shade, some, some snowy, icy sections. I think it will probably be wanting to climb into a car for the descent. Yeah, which the last time we did this, if my gear, like the last time we tried it, my bottom gear was a 3925, which for my fitness level is not adequate to be doing super flag. <laughs> You know, but I, it's like the last time I did super flag was in a, about again about 2002 or thereabouts, right? And so I remember going up that thing in like a you know 3921, being like fine, you know. And so all of a sudden I'm like, oof, wow, I can't even move this gear. I think I'll be in a 36, 32. <laughs> that, that, that's what <laughs> that sounds I'm, about right. That, that's about what I. That's what I'm hopefully going to have by tomorrow. I didn't realize you were on a 3925. <laughs> yeah, that was it. what that was that day. That was a... Ugh. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so there's another excuse. <laughs> but it's, but anyway, the point is, is the sand won't be quite so bad now that if I've got a little more gear, I can sit. Well, everyone, you'll be able to catch this on the Cycling Tips YouTube channel. If you haven't subscribed to that, do so. Uh, I would imagine we get this out in the next week week and a half i don't know it depends how long it takes to edit if up. somebody does fall over it'll be on there yeah, it'll be on do, Twitter do we release the winner before the video goes out or does this have to remain a secret i've I kind of been wondering about that I think that's to remain a secret it would be nice we were we talking did. about live streaming the whole thing but maybe i'll just shut it off right as uh yeah like right at talks. the crux moment <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, before we uh, before we wrap this up, thanks, JV, for coming. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I'm going to go like get a massage and start eating pasta or whatever for <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. That's right. <laughs> we will we'll see you again in 24 we'll see hours. You in 24 hours, yeah. Yeah, all right. Thanks Sounds for joining. Good. Thanks for coming. See I, you tomorrow. I wish you good luck, but yeah. I'm not yeah. doing that. We won't be so friendly tomorrow. <laughs> Brief snack break. Abby brought chocolate chip cookies. Yum. Crumbs. A lot of crumbs. What's the secret, Abby? Coconut oil mm. is the secret ingredient to make them crispy yet fluffy. And I found it very impressive that you have a tin of crispier ones and kind of less done ones. Yeah, the ones that are um, crispy are because I know people, some people, some people prefer the cookie dough to the cookie. Right here. Softer the better. Seconded. Seconded. Before we wrap up for today, we uh, we actually just opened up access to the Cycling Tips annual. Once again, we, due to popular demand, we sort of opened up uh, the sale of those again, which means if you become a Velo Club member now, and I mean like in the next few days, we will ship you our annual, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous... It's actually closer to a book than a magazine. It's almost like a coffee table book. It's really gorgeous. Uh, We'll ship this to you ahead of your preferred midwinter holiday. Christmas, Hanukkah, whatever that may be. So, get on it. Become a Velo Club member. Support this podcast. Support all of our other podcasts. Support all of Cycling Tips. And get your annual. You know, speaking of tech and gears, I don't believe Vodders was on a (laughs) 39.25 when we rode together a month ago. I think he was on a 36.25. I'm not entirely sure he's going to show up tomorrow. <laughs> Do we think he's clean right now? <laughs> I mean, who rides a 39 anymore these days? <laughs> what bikes come equipped with a 53.39 anymore? An old bike. A spare team bike. Yeah, a spare team bike. Yeah, it could bike. be. Yeah, it could yep. be. All right. That's enough for today. Thank you, all of you, for listening. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see us waving goodbye. Bye. Abby, wave. Right. There we go. And we'll be back next week. We got through this episode with only one dog crapping on the floor. <laughs> <laughs>